This evening's event is made possible by the generosity of the Meyer Foundation, Grand Valley State University, and more than 300 members of the Hallenstein Center, Friends of Ralph, we call them, uh, who sustain us year in and year out. Thank you all for your support. We especially appreciate your support for our students. This evening's Leadership Minute is presented by Havila Emker. Havila is an interdisciplinary studies major who also um, majors in uh, religion and dramaturgy and has been the dramaturge for two plays at Grand Rapids Civic Theater. We are delighted that she works at the Hallenstein Center and that she's been selected to be one of our lead fellows for next year. So please lend your attention to Havila. Hi, I'm Havala, and I'm a second year fellow candidate with the Cook Leadership Academy, and it's my privilege to bring to you the Leadership Minute. When you're the quietest person in the back of the room, no one really tells you that you could be a leader. They thank you for your hard work and your warm presence and then choose someone else for the promotion. I was that person until I got the call two years ago from the Cook Leadership Academy inviting me to be a part of the cohort. That was the first time I thought maybe just maybe I could be a leader. But I spent the next year convinced that there had been a mistake because there was no way I belonged in that room surrounded by some of the most brilliant of my peers. But I survived, didn't get kicked out, and the next year when I walked into the room, my fellow candidates looked to me to lead the conversation. And when I thought back to the year before and the lessons I had learned about my leadership skills and how to have vulnerable conversations, I realized in that moment that I am a leader. I lead by observation and listening and encouragement. But in my quietness, I am a leader. My name is Havala Emker, and I'm a leader. Thank you. We're so proud of you, Havala. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay, well, I want to greet you with happy Super Tuesday, but how happy today's uh, primary palooza turns out to be will depend on the will of voters in some 14 states from California to Maine. And uh, they're going to uh, do the great democratic sorting and determine how strong the surviving Democrats will be on their road to, to Milwaukee. Now, given the wave of enthusiasm explicitly surrounding Bernie Sanders, especially among young people, Questions arise. Is democratic socialism an idea whose time has come? Are the American people ready for the transformation of our nat nation into, say, something like uh, the United States of Sweden? Or is socialism a flawed, a seriously flawed ideology that is alluring mostly to dreamers and to central planners, something better likened to, say, the United States of Venezuela? Or getting past any cliches, is democratic socialism something else that we need to explore more fully this evening, especially based on what we know about it historically? To help us answer these questions and more, we have invited best-selling author Amity Schles to our stage to talk about her most recent book, Great Society. You may recall Amity's previous visits to Grand Valley in 2009 when she debated Jonathan Alter over FDR's New Deal, and then she came back in 2013 and debated and talked about Calvin Coolidge, uh, and she was, in fact, establishing a foundation in Coolidge's name at that time. Well, this evening's presentation is about the third wave of progressivism, and you know it from the 1960s. Many of you were around to experience the Great Society and its ramifications. Michael Barone recently summarized Amity's book this way in a review. Quote, Neither Hoover nor Roosevelt ended the Depression. Neither Johnson nor Nixon ended poverty. The genuine achievements of the 1940s and 1950s led them to imagine they could, and that is one of the lessons of great society, that success can often, ironically, breed failure. Even the best-intentioned and most well-informed people can pursue policies that turn out to be counterproductive and even destructive. Close quote. Well, you can see that Amity is not afraid to challenge those narratives that hold the progressive movement in high regard. She never fails to be uh, as provocative as she is informative. And her counter-narrative about the Great Society will surely challenge us very much this evening. Please give Amity a warm Michigan welcome. 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me well? That, always raise your hand if you can't hear me, please. I don't mind stopping. Uh, if I'd been here a week ago, I might have been talking about Senator Amy or Mayor Pete. Um, and I will mention that Senator Amy and I were not only in the same class, but in the same dormitory in college. So I feel a little for her. Um, alas, um, they are off the stage. But one figure that is still on the 2020 stage and likely to stay is the figure of socialism. Let's anthropomorphize socialism. Uh, socialism has starred this round, no question about it. Socialism has affected all the candidates, not just Senator Sanders. Some candidates have claimed to be socialists and others have merely suggested they can work with socialism, temper it, call it democratic socialism, call it social democracy. Whatever you call it, socialism is not going away. What is socialism? It is redistribution. Simple as that. Um, heading, you know, this has happened in the past. This is not a new thing for the United States. Um, Mr. Whitney spoke about the New Deal, the rescue program for the Great Depression in the 1930s. We adopted measures that took us toward redistribution. Um, in the 60s, we had a terrific expansion, sort of like now, at least until this week, that is economic expansion. And we thought we would also, you know, we thought we could redistribute some more. Um, our candidates always evoke these past campaigns, especially the Great Society, the 1960s endeavor. Um, today, people are very idealistic, so they cite the idealism of the Great Society. It wasn't called the Good Society, right? It was called the Great Society. You hear now about curing poverty, and you hear that President Lyndon Johnson promised to do that too. And you hear about universal income. Well, there was a universal income, people note, uh, effort in the 1960s. You hear about more help benefits, opportunities for the disadvantaged. Of course, that was the center of the new great society, the war on poverty. You hear about racial equality and more redistribution. You hear about top quality infrastructure. That was also architecture, particularly was an effort of the great society. And when people refer to this and draw these analogies, there's always a lot of nostalgia in the voice, right? Um, so you imagine, people miss the energy of Lyndon Johnson, um, who, who uh, was a master of legislation. It was said Lyndon Johnson made laws the way other men eat chocolate chip cookies. He, what about, we could never do that now, right? Um, and you think of, for example, the supporters of Senator Sanders, who uh, work hard to evoke the excitement, one said, if you were sitting there in 1931 or 1963 when New Deal or Great Society got going, you could not have predicted what FDR's New Deal or LBJ's Great Society would be. Boy, was it the implication being something fantastic, something large. Change can come in a moment. Um, such references do stir up excitement and hope. Um, but they do not look at the result of the great society. So tonight, I propose we look at both the promise and the result of the great society, and then talk about what we think. Who led the change? What happened when the government expansionists won a victory in their fields? We don't have to be cruel. Almost every single person in the great society was a good person. In fact, the lesson of the Great Society is that lovable people were trying to do something for people whom they loved and hurt those people in the process. But you can't really understand the Great Society without telling it through its own heroes. So tonight, I will talk about two of them. Their story is a brave story, a sad story. More some happiness, but more sad than happy, and a good share of it is about the state of Michigan. 
The United Auto Workers play a role in my story. It takes a minute to tell, which is why I'm grateful to my friends who came. I want to mention Fred and Wendy Wooden, if they are here. There they are. Gleaves, Hillary Snell, the Howenstein Center, other friends including Hank Meyer, historian, and you, this audience, for your time tonight. The name of my first hero is Daniel Patrick Moynihan. You've heard that name. Maybe you've heard of his later career as senator from New York, the legendary, was part of his name, the legendary, right? Um, uh, you know, just like the powerful was part of Wilbur Mills' name, the powerful Wilbur Mills in the day. Uh, he was the kind of American many of us have known, either as, usually as, sometimes as grandparent, sometimes as parent. He was, uh, or sometimes as oneself, we honor you. That is, he was born in the mid-20s, and he was a soul shaped by a terrible blow, the blow that was the Great Depression. His father had trouble either finding or holding on to work. Um, dad began to disappear. Moynihan's father eventually disappeared permanently. It was said he disappeared into the Depression. That's what men did. So Moynihan grew up essentially fatherless. His mother married several times. Um, she had troubles, moved in and out of New York City. Um, he worked shining shoes. He worked as a Steve Dorr, and he saw what happened to poor people. He saw what happened to his family without the father. He saw what happened to all kinds of families, Puerto Rican families, black families, and he became interested in ethnicity. In his childhood, Moynihan discovered one rescuer, and that rescuer was the government. Government paid for him to go at night while he worked tuition-free to the City College of New York, an engine of social mobility. Government paid, when he joined the Navy, for him to go to Middlebury and collect degrees at Tufts and to study at the London School of Economics. I, later, Moynihan said, I never saw a tuition bill. Can you imagine saying that? I never. It was. He became a social scientist with that interest um, in ethnicity, in unions, in auto safety, in architecture. But he, 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 generally, he liked government. He was frank about it. He was a man made by government. He knew and he saw it. And what a fine man he was. You've always heard of the best and the brightest, which usually refers to the military and foreign policy advisors. Um, who supported Presidents Kennedy and Johnson in the Vietnam War. It's ironic, but that's what they were called. Um, there was also a domestic best and the brightest, and Moynihan was one of those, clear-minded. He said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. And that could be our theme tonight. It was said um, that had he been airlifted, from the 1900s to the 1700s, he would have fit in just fine in Philadelphia and been one of the signers of the Declaration or the Constitution. By the way, he was very tall, but kind of endearing. I think you've seen pictures, often wore a bow tie. Uh, one way, uh, I think Time Magazine it was, that referred to him as a super elf energetically padding around the basement of the Wall Street writing future law. He wasn't a socialist, but he thought he could work with socialists. I mentioned he attended the London School of Economics. The LSE was founded by socialists, including Graham Wallace, who invented, well, coined the phrase great society. Well, um, Moynihan saw that the people at the LSE liked to argue they shut out no one. They never canceled people. Um, an important example, that cancel being the word we use to, shun, uh, to describe shunning someone because we don't agree with him, her. Um, they, an important example of the LSC's magnanimity was the invitation to, uh, to, it extended to Friedrich von Hayek. Hayek was the opposite of a socialist, and even the opposite of a Moynihan. 
Um, he thought planning itself was pernicious, Hayek did. That there was a fatal conceit of vanity in planning. He didn't believe results would be better. They were led by the best and the brightest. He didn't even believe in pragmatic little compromises. He said each additional step one takes, however miniature, towards redistribution. Socialism was a step further down the wrong road, and pretty soon you found you couldn't turn around. And that was the road to serfdom. I'm sure you've heard of Hayek's book. And yet, well, Hayek had been allowed at the LSE. If the socialist LSE, largely socialist, could host Hayek, Moynihan thought, socialists weren't all that bad. In the 50s and the 60s, Moynihan became friend with, friends with socialists. You've heard of J.D. Vance, who wrote Hillbilly Elegy. You, got, you know that book, which is about, um, in part, the poverty in Appalachia. The J.D. Vance of the early 60s was a socialist named Michael Harrington, who wrote a book that also focused on Appalachia called The Other American, uh, The Other America, excuse me, The Other America about the poverty in that region. And he became Moynihan's friend, Harrington and Moynihan. Moynihan wanted to get into politics. Um, when Senator John F. Kennedy moved toward the presidency and in the White House, he was naturally thrilled. Kennedy inspired Moynihan. After all, Kennedy and Moynihan were kind of similar. They were great talkers. They were relatively young. They were both Catholics educated in largely Protestant institutions. In government, um, Moynihan got there. He got a little job, a small job in the Labor Department, modest but exciting. He wanted to write real policy. They gave him a very little assignment. The Democrats um, at the time, not to mention the Socialists, wanted a change in the law. They wanted to repeal a provision known as right to work. And I think many of you have heard of that. It's in the Taft-Hartley law. It's the law that allows states and companies in the states effectively to opt out of the tightest union strictures. Um, well, you know, many in Washington thought that was too radical to repeal right to work and put all of America back in Wagner Act union land, even perhaps Kennedy himself. So the Kennedy administration assigned young Moynihan, the super elf, to write a compromise, something to, a gift to give labor, a small gift, a token. And that was an executive order about a rare group nobody thought much about called public sector workers, federal, federal public sector workers. They were already in associations. They were tame. They weren't wild like industrial unions, Moynihan thought. And they wanted to bargain collectively. Why not, said Moynihan. Um, he drafted up what became Executive Order 10988 to formalize unions in the federal public sector. He was proud of it, but he didn't think it was all that significant, this executive order. After all, it did not give public sector workers the right to strike. That would have been trouble, thought Moynihan. Um, and, you know, he took it over to the White House. Kennedy signs it. Kennedy. Uh, sort of mumbled some hesitation. You can read this in Moynihan's oral history in the Kennedy Library, but then moved on. Um, what Moynihan remembered about the day Executive Order 10988 was signed was that the Prez was a little distracted by his daughter, Caroline, the toddler, and there was something going on about her pony as well. A set a second task, small, Moynihan took pride in related to the infrastructure and government buildings. Government buildings were kind of a mishmash, a compromise between the big federal government and the people who happened to live around the place where the new federal building was going in, right? We want cupolas. We like Neo-Georgian. We want a weather vane. Whatever people would say they want in the community meeting, that's what it was with the big federal government, right? This was, that's the way federal gov government buildings were built in Washington and across the country. Moynihan thought this was ridiculous. America was grand, it needed bold, grand architecture. So he crafted another benign sounding document, a short memo that came to be known as Guiding Principles for Federal Architecture. 
he was tired of these citizens and their rambling, inconsistent architectural consensus, right? He said, architects, real professionals such as himself, social planners should take the lead on buildings, especially prestigious modern architects. I'll read you his language, open quote. Design must flow from the architectural profession to the government and not vice versa. Where's the word citizen in that sentence? Um, the advice of distinguished architects should be sought, they should be paid, and then modern buildings, new buildings, would look better and more professional and more inspiring. That was his idea. Moynihan wanted to get serious. He remembered his past. He wanted to help poor people, disadvantaged people, families without fathers. So soon he was involved in drawing up the centerpiece in Johnson's War on Poverty, a project led by a group of departments. There was a new poverty czar that was Kennedy's, uh, the late President Kennedy's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, and Moynihan was somehow involved in the committee to write this new law for President Johnson, War on Poverty Law, and so was Michael Harrington, the socialist. Johnson let Harrington in for a minute. Um, and they all sat together and worked on the law, in part in the Moynihan's house, and Mrs. Moynihan, Liz, made the people drafting our poverty law spaghetti for dinner. <laughs> the re result was a law that would be very familiar to those today. It w the aim wasn't to pay people, really. It was to educate them. You think of Head Start. And it was to make disadvantaged people in cities wake up, to make them woke. To, so they would fight for their rights, claim their own franchise, and sometimes, yes, um, the interpretation of the, wall, of the law was demonstrate, make trouble to be heard. Generally, it sounded moderate. Mon Moynihan was sure this new legislation would help his career. He was a magnanimous fellow, I mentioned that. And by the time President Johnson signed the poverty bill into law, Michael Harrington was gone, to socialist for Johnson, so when Johnson handed out the ceremonial pens that presidents give out when they've signed a law that people work so hard on, Moynihan got in line and collected Moynihan's special commemorative pen. And then Moynihan got in line again and went around and collected a second pen for his friend, Michael Harrington. Another Moynihan project. Um, I'll just mention a last, more advancement for the poor and black Americans. He wrote a monograph for internal consumption of the White House only, suggesting that family break, um, breakdown made it hard for black families to get education, to find serious employment, or for their children to learn a trade. This needed to be recognized, he said, and it was, remember, his own personal story, the absence of a father. He himself had nearly fallen through cracks. Second, um, he played a role in convincing President Johnson to shift policy. In the first part of his presidency, President Johnson emphasized equality of opportunity. Moynihan thought that wasn't quite enough from his sociology, so he was going to get, hope Johnson would get equality of result. When did Johnson turn? In a speech at Howard University in 1965, he spoke about something more than equality of opportunity, the president did, but also equality of result. I think you can count Moynihan as, uh, as one of the fathers of the disparate impact discussion, of affirmative action, and many other things we, we talk about today, almost not knowing it. What people did notice at the time was not the affirmative action, but the internal memo on the black family. The memo was leaked and Moynihan portrayed by new activists as a racist for signal, signaling, I can't talk, sing, singling out black Americans instead of becoming captain of his government's civil rights campaign, which is what Moynihan probably envisioned. Moynihan was shut out altogether. The president didn't want to deal with someone who might be called racist, right? And old acquaintances like Martin Luther King called Moynihan to express their sympathy. Here he was being called the wrong thing, but they didn't always dare to announce in public that they believed in exoneration for Moynihan. Um, in fact, when a conference, um, a Washington conference was held on race relations, civil rights, 
Um, in the fall of 65, uh, Moynihan doubtless had helped to organize this, at least in the beginning. The, the, uh, the host at the conference said, I've been reliably informed that no person named Daniel Patrick Moynihan exists. Today, we do talk about canceling people. Moynihan was the first big public figure I know about to be canceled in that way for the crime of what? Cultural appropriation. It was not what he had expected because of his days at the liberal London School of Economics. It all hurt. He runs back to uh, colleges. He was academic to Wesley and then Harvard. He still wants to do something good. He's willing to sacrifice a lot to do something good. So he breaks with his own party, the Democrats, and actually his wife. They don't get divorced, but it's rough. And decides he's going to work for Richard Nixon. Can you believe it? Um, he had this idea. He didn't like welfare. He'd figured out that it was what he called feeding the horses to feed the sparrows, that is, subsidizing bureaucracy and not getting to the people who really needed the money. He wanted to give everyone cash, each man cash. As in America, we had given, what, each man a certain number of acres at a certain point, right? Universal guaranteed income. I think you've heard that discussion. That would dignify people. Um, actually, the old office where he had worked, the Office of Economic Opportunity, was running some pilots about guaranteed income, universal income, also for low-earning people who are already in the workforce. And th that would test the validity of his hypothesis, very important for a social scientist. Nixon kind of liked the cause. Nixon wanted more Democrats to support him, thought this would win guaranteed income, sounded like it would win Democrats and social Democrats over as it happened. This version of guaranteed income never became law, and instead Nixon and his, um, his colleagues just increased benefits, especially uh, then still new food, food stamps. Vietnam War is like a drum behind the stage getting louder and louder. Moynihan was proud, but to his surprise, he was vilified now just for working with Nixon because Nixon was leading us or trying to lead us out of the war, but still in the war. Um, Moynihan's old house in Cambridge, Massachusetts was picketed by students. They threatened to do damage to his house. His wife was inside it. He had the divinity students had to guard his house. Moynihan couldn't believe it. What? He was a good guy. And he went home to Cambridge and thus a decade in a policy career. My second hero is Walter Ruther. Ruther was a similar figure, a, another good man. He wasn't as tall as Moynihan, but he was definitely feisty. This is the leader of the United Auto Workers, then a very large union, more than a million, um, leader of the auto workers for the big three. He had helped to create the UAW. I, I think some of you in the room know better than I do, but I'll say it anyhow for those who might not be familiar, to unionize the big three automakers, and he had the scars to prove it. You've seen the faces, um, the bloodied faces in the pictures of his efforts to unionize in the 1930s. Um, that he had endured an assassination attempt and lost strength in one arm. Um, he remained feisty and kind of uh, just always kind of likable and admirable, um, and it was fun to watch him get mad. An attorney who worked with Ruther on civil rights said this about Ruther when he got angry. When he got mad, um, he got so mad you, um, that you could fry an egg on his heart. <laughs> When imagine a, um, someone like that. W what are Ruther's goals in the 1960s? Um, he wants to make a social democracy. He wants to get rid of right to work, that Taft-Hartley provision, to make all America a social democracy, Scandinavian-style sky union land. He saw that kids were going to college, not to factories. He wanted youth outreach, college branch. That's the problem with unions, he said. We've become part of the establishment. Mm. Uh, he wanted to. He wanted equality for blacks. He, he, his personal dream was no more bigotry in the sometimes bigoted UAW.
W, no more bigotry in America, and he acted on these goals. I think you've heard, and in some ways I hadn't known about until I did the research for a Great Society book, you've heard about the Port Huron Statement. People have heard about that. It came out of a student and activist group that met in Port Huron at some, I will say, dumpy little lakeside cabins um, and wrote a manifesto in that rustic setting, which ranged wide from, I don't know, college dormitory rules to changing our entire society. But the Port Huron Statement was always regarded as the statement of an independent young generation, a, a generational declaration of independence. What I learned in researching this book was those people at Port Huron weren't exactly entirely independent. In fact, the very reason the activists were at the Port Huron retreat, whose name was actually Four Freedoms after Roosevelt, was that it was a union camp. And what had really happened was the, the students at Michigan had called Walter Ruther's right-hand lady, Millie Jeffrey, um, one of them was Millie's daughter, Sharon, um, and said, where can we stay when we have our retreat? And she said, why not Four Freedoms? Port Huron, and they obtained it, something like that. Um, second, many of the people at Port Huron, including Tom Hayden, were paid by Walter Ruther. Um, it wasn't a, a total secret. They were working for youth outreach, but it gives you a different picture of what Port Huron actually was. Um, more of the, the auxiliary effort by Ruther than the total uh, independence anthem. Ruther waged other battles uh, to get repeal of right to work, for example. He didn't get that. He fought hard for civil rights. I think you can count him in as one of the fathers of the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. Um, it was the UAW that sent bail money, cash, uh, down to Martin Luther King when he was in the Birmingham jail. Bobby Kennedy called Walter Ruther and said, please help me on this. Um, and they helped Martin Luther King. Um, those are, I consider them in this book, the, the good laws of the 1960s, 1964 and 1965. And of course, Ruther did his regular union job and all too well. He fought for higher benefits and pay for his membership. He got that. He handled Henry Ford too very well. Um, so the packages got bigger and bigger. He worked to make his own union a social democracy. He planned a beautiful retreat far nicer uh, than Port Huron at Black Lake for his own workers, Scandinavia style. He knew Willy Brandt. He knew Olaf Palma. He'd seen what they did in Europe, and he was enamored. Um, you know, there was sturgeon in Black Lake, so wow, they might even have caviar. The symbolism was very rich. Workers eating their own caviar with the sturgeon they caught, right? It wasn't reality. I don't think there's caviar from the sturgeon, but the idea was nice, Black Lake. And, Ruther was very proud of this great worker retreat he planned. He walked around it wearing a little kind of a hunter's cap and inspected things like a friendly prince, a place to make his workers happy. He might have got farther. You know, a tragedy occurred in 1971. He was going to see the progress on his beautiful social democratic resort, Black Lake. He actually uh, decided to take his wife, May, and they got in a Learjet. Um, and it was almost dark, and the pilots couldn't see. And when the pilots came to land near Black Lake, I think it was Onaway, their plane clipped the trees, and they ended up in an inferno. And they were all gone. There you have it. A career ended too early, Ruther, and a, a, uh, an important segment of a career, Moynihan. I offer up all these details about these gents' lives not only because they're compelling, but because Moynihan and Ruther were representative, the best representatives of thousands of planners who aimed to transform America, that domestic best and the brightest. So now we come to the result. What happened where the great society figures, most especially Ruther and Moynihan, succeeded? The results of their success of getting what they asked for in terms of legislation range from poor to awful. 
Moynihan, Executive Order 10988. That little benign sounding executive order regarding government unions changed, as you probably know, the entire public sector union culture. Associations of workers shifted into the tougher union format and stance, emulating the unions of the federal government, public sector unions um, in towns, counties, school districts, formed or strengthened. Today, the union membership of the public sector workers, that is the share of public sector workers who are in a union, is 33% or five times higher than the unionization in the private sector. These unions, Moynihan was right, by and large, don't or can't strike. Um, but to compensate for the lack of strike and strike possibility, and many of you have been town administrators, so you know, what do governments do when a worker can't strike and they want to make them feel great? They overpay them or they promise to pay them the workers lots later without having the means in the town coffers or the town's account at Vanguard, right? And so there are shortfalls, pension shortfalls, and those are the pension shortfalls we have in multiple states that are about to rock our lives today. All in good measure because of one executive order. The infrastructure, architecture, Moynans, he'd pushed for new and modern. Um, the guidelines he wrote took on the force of law in the federal government, um, and they served as the seal of approval for hundreds of buildings. At the time, the international style or um, and brutalism, a sort of subset, were quite fashionable, that's what the best architects did. Think of Lyndon Johnson's own presidential library by Gordon Bunshaft in Austin, all concrete looking with a bare plaza. So that's what the buildings were, big cinder block, concrete, interesting new materials, very barren and hated by the people who worked in them. <laughs> um, they were the opposite of great, and we've all built some of these, so mea culpa, right? Um, they aged poorly, these buildings, they were unfriendly to citizens, right? They were more friendly to the idea of the citizenry. Think of the HUD building built by Marcel Breuer, that's a brutalist building. Um, Jack Kemp, I'm told, called it 10 floors of basement. <laughs> because at every floor you still feel like you're down there. Um, and irony, um, I like Moynihan because he saw irony. Moynihan found himself stuck in a modern, such a modern building um, when he was ambassador to India. The official residence, residence was by Edward Stone, really modern, without any curlicues. And Mrs. Moynihan hated that official residence for the ambassador. She called it a mausoleum or a motel. Um, Moynihan himself said uh, you know, it was an example of an artist creator who knew one thing, like the hedgehog, and that thing he knew was wrong. <laughs> I, I think I don't have to rehearse the equality of result story. Um, instead of bringing the country together, the goal of equality of outcome drove us apart and set us against one another. We're still equalizing in 2020. Ruther's achievements, well, his youth movement did grow, but not how he wanted, not into the UAW College Auxiliary. Uh, his move, move, youth movement instead became the legendary infamous Students for a Democratic Society that became violent, went off the rails, turned in some of them to the weathermen. The youth movement, uh, what bothered him particularly was the youth movement so radicalized the Democratic Party that they rendered the Democratic Party unelectable. Very similar discussion to today. So the, root, the youth that Walter Ruther supported were what made it possible for the country in 1968 to elect his worst enemy, the union's enemy, Richard Nixon. A man, right, a man who ran on law and order and against the weathermen, what an irony. Ruther's greatest success and his greatest violence, though, came from his traditional victories, those high wages and packages, benefits that he won from employers for his loyal UAW employees. The wage compensation increases were very large, as it emerged in the book I talk a lot about the competition from Toyota, too large 
to keep Detroit or Flint competitive, two places he loved, two places he built his career. In fact, um, and I will add Henry Ford too colluded on this. So in fact, Ruther, as likable as they come, and Henry Ford, well, they were killers. They colluded and advertently or inadvertently, they killed Detroit and Flint. Look where these gents did not succeed, guaranteed income. I think it's a great thing they didn't succeed. Moynihan was honest. I'll tell you those little pilots where they were studying guaranteed income uh, didn't work out. When people were paid quite a bit um, and they weren't working, they didn't really feel like going to work. <laughs> it turned out in the little pilot studies. And Moynihan acknowledged this. He wrote to William F. Buckley, were we wrong? <laughs> Oh, oh, glad we didn't do that, um, so thank goodness they didn't. Because once people have guaranteed income, particularly a, a large swath of society have guaranteed income, there's no way you're ever going to be able to cut it or take it away. All of them had promised, especially President Johnson and Ruther, repeal of right to work. The president never got around to that. That was one chocolate chip cookie that was never made. Um, the repeal of the right to work provision. Um, the rule remained as before. You could opt out if you were a state of right, uh, um, I'm sorry, of, um, of traditional union laws and have right to work. Um, or you could be in union land. A state could make that choice and its companies could. So what happened? The result was a beautiful natural experiment. Compare states with right to work to states that don't have right to work. One. Michigan observed keenly and made it switch. Those states, and I have nice charts in the back of the book to show this, those states that had right to work grew faster and created more jobs. It wasn't just the air conditioning or the climate that made certain places very attractive. I'm thinking here of Florida, Texas, and so on. What about the good parts of the great society? I want to mention Medicare, Medicaid, they're fine for us. Some of us have loved them, but they're not good for our children. In fact, they pose a tax burden on us and our children heavier than, I don't know, any brutalist building. Right? What you can, I concluded in this book, and I think many of you will conclude as you, as you review the data, is that there are no grounds for nostalgia here. The great society's successes cause us problems today. We should hesitate to praise the alacrity with which legislation moved. And thank heaven, the great society didn't succeed more. I told you what happened, and now I'll speak just a little bit about why. The, the story of Moynihan, the story of Ruth, the story of the period reveals the why. What caused the trouble was the planning. The federal government is not very good at planning. When it makes a little compromise, it thinks nothing of it, and yet there are multiple results, a chain of results, uh, sometimes a big result, perversely, and true disaster. State budgets would look entirely different had we not permitted a revolution in public sector unions. Public architecture would look entirely different and probably be, if not always lovable, then at least not offensive, right? Um, minorities might have fared better had they received money for education and instead of being taught to study their identity. Detroit and Flint might have lived longer and better ha um, had the unions and the automakers not forced them into an uncompetitive, uncompetitive situation, had not negotiated their own private fantasy land. Why? Does planning fail? The answer actually lies with that other LSE student and professor, Fred Hayek. Um, at Friedrich Hayek spoke of something called the knowledge problem. Those of us who have a business know that you get a lot of feedback in a business. You know in about 10 seconds whether the price you set is too low or too high, right? Or whether the product is faulty and you have to rejigger it. You have constant feedback through the consumer, through your competitors. That's not what government is like. Government is insulated. Gover to government, what's happening out there is also a distant din. So government is sitting in its shell, thinking about what it wants without much concern um, for or knowledge about, that's why it's called the knowledge problem, it, the feedback. 
And that is why government is a poor planner. Um, planners always, by the way, interpret trouble as a signal for more planning. That's their temperament, right? <laughs> Hayek was also correct about another thing. Step-by-step -step compromises can be dangerous too. They do lead to a road to serfdom. Going halfway to socialism is too far. You do get there. It's not like Zeno's paradox. You, you do get there. One of the reasons I'm glad to be here, and this is at least my third time here, maybe my sixth with, with other visits, is because I love the communities of Western Michigan. The answer to centralized planning can be local planning. Why is local planning better? Because you see with your own eyes what a school needs. It doesn't need a gym, it needs Spanish lessons. It needs um, another uh, annex room for the extra students. It needs computers. And you make the right choice as a planner. From Washington, this is all very far away. Um, what a need might be in Grand Rapids, and therefore Washington's allocations are inferior. Um, I hope you continue your very famous local work. Um, I, I think the second lesson for us all is that the evidence of the past is there for us to consider. We don't even have to talk about Venezuela or the Soviet Union when we talk about socialism. It's there in our own history. So a second work for you and for me that's very important is to always include the record in our argument. Socialists should include the record in their argument and capitalists should include the record of capitalist and capitalism in their argument and we should hold the other party to account. Nobody gets a nostalgia pass, neither side. I'll close by thanking you um, and say this is uh, socialism is not like the coronavirus. It doesn't even need a quarantine. It just needs um, what the progressive Louis Brandeis asked for, which is a little sunshine to expose every corner of it. Um, look at the record, share the record, and I'm confident that Americans will make the right choice. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I like your critique of planning, uh, but as I'm in the Howenstein Center event, I, I feel called to mention that, you know, we have planned some great things. Uh, World War II pointed out, you know, D-Day was really a major event of planning, and maybe localized planning wouldn't have done the same thing, or, or the interstate highway system, maybe localized planning wouldn't have given us that. I mean, isn't planning more of a mixed bag than Well, than it's that? always a measure, a, a question of degree, it's not either or. I would say we need a lot less centralized planning. The, the best case for planning is the interstate, maybe. You want to consider all the families that were displaced by the interstate and so brutally. Uh, so it, it, maybe, but uh, you know, it, it, often planners make the wrong bet. Think of the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a giant bet on that hydropower was the most competitive form of power and always would be in the United States and the US must be organized by river basin. So logical, right? That was the premise of, of the hydropower craze. So, so yes, um, I'm for less planning. Um, no planning isn't always possible. And I mean, not gonna, you wanna leave room for surprise. There's a lot of serendipity in the world. I'm not going to raise the tired example of the internet, but you know what I mean. And if you leave room surpri for surprise, your problems may be solved. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thinking about uh, health care, and I was wondering if you could softball question for you. What is a right, and is health care a human right? I don't think healthcare is a right because I adhere to um, the vision of negative and positive rights. So a negative right, I'm oversimplifying and I didn't bring my chart, so forgive me if I'm a little fuzzy, is the right to be left alone, the right to be free, the right to pursue your work without being bothered, and the right to own property. A positive right is closer to an entitlement. I think we have the right to work to provide for our family and then provide our family with health care not starting with healthcare as a human right. As, as compelling as that would be, 
um, it's not feasible. And uh, I want to mention one example of something we did for healthcare and humanity in the 1960s, um, which was really terrible, which is we encouraged countries around the world um, to practice birth control and to pack, practice population control, however, and pegged foreign aid to the rigor with which they demonstrated that practice. What did that cause? And that was our development for health. We need fewer people so we can have good health care for the people we have. It led to the forced sterilization in India, the, one of the most outrageous things that has happened lately. Um, and that's often what happens. You get pretty fast when you say everyone is entitled to something, you get pretty fast to some awful uh, dirigiste diris, triage because you can't, of course, give everyone every bit of health care he or she needs. I want to thank you very much for an excellent book. I read it, oh, and you. I also lived through that. Oh. And I grew up in Detroit and actually know some of the people you mentioned in the book. Uh, what I want to ask you is that in the business world, quite often there's this tension between centralization and decentralization. And it goes back and forth. And some companies that are very famous eventually decay and fall apart, like General Electric or something like that, or General Motors. Government doesn't seem to go through that. There's no correcting factor going on that. Would you make some comments on that and also the influence of technology from generation to generation? Well, the, you kind of answered your question. The question was, um, businesses fall apart when they're not doing too well. When they're, when they're operating subpar, they fall apart, but government is forever. Um, but parts of government fall apart. You think of what modern technology has done to the post office. The post office needs business to thrive. It was supposed to be a going concern, uh, and it can't be because of the competition from newer uh, ways of transmitting knowledge, because it failed in part. Because it, um, uh, so, uh, Oh, I think the, the reason government stays big is the commitment to positive rights, basically, that we've made to social democracy that we've made that has to be gone at philosophically so that government can be allowed to evolve and shrink. Okay. <laughs> right. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was just thinking a little bit. It seems to me like there were like sort of two major... Uh, themes in your talk that maybe characterized how you think about socialism. One is uh, kind of top-down centralized planning, and the other is redistribution of uh, wealth. And both of those strike me as basically correct, and I'm, I'm sympathetic in general to Friedrich August von Hayek's critique of the planning in particular. I mean, I work at a university where centralized administration, you know, from the top down, makes decisions that I'm not always thrilled with, and I think maybe that's indicative of my sympathy with that critique. Um, you know, at this, at, at, but at the same time, I guess when I think about the re, I, I wonder how closely connected these two ideas are, because even if we say on the redistrib redistributive front, even if we say that uh, there's not some special thing, a positive right, uh, we might think that you know some goods, uh, some public goods, are better dealt with in a public way than in a private way, and there I would go right back to something like. Education. I mean, healthcare is another one people often talk about, but education, where it's it's not entirely clear that the markets would just provide for that in an unregulated way. That is, provide for the kind and quality of education, not just to produce uh, technical education, but education in the humanities. I mean, frankly, people who could read and understand Friedrich August von Hayek. And so, I wonder if you just if you could address. I mean, honestly, you know, I, teaching in the philosophy. I like that cartoon I version. I, I'm sorry. I like the cartoon version of, of Hayek. Oh, is, it, is there a cartoon yes, version of Hayek? Oh. There absolutely is. It's we great. need to talk after then, because I need that reference. I will, <laughs> I will so share it with my students. But if, if you could maybe like, address that kind of concern, right? Because you said at the end, it's important to recognize problems uh, that might arise on both sides. And when I think about the pressures that have come down on higher education, especially since 2008 um, and, and the market crash there, uh, redistribution you know, can, just, can preserve certain social goods that we might not otherwise have without making any special claims about 
rights, just saying the markets aren't efficient at fulfilling all needs. Yeah, that would be a thing I'd like but to hear That's a very important question. Um, my no. quarrel with the concept of public goods, that is things that private groups don't necessarily produce by themselves, can we agree on that, right? Um, is that they're different publics. Uh, and this public, the local public, does a lot. That's different from the federal public, the Washington public, because this public knows the people who are helping it and whom it helps. Very different situation. So um, one of the, that is to say, not everything should come from Washington. It's less evil when it comes from the local and sometimes good. Um, I don't think Bernie Sanders appreciates um, the importance of charity, but I don't think President Trump does either. So I'm not gonna be political always, right? So, so there you are. Um, the second thing I would say is um, looking backwards to history, we tend to get taught, and when I debated Jonathan Alter here at the Fountain Street Church, right? Is that right? Yep. Um, he, he basically said um, in the constant text of that somewhere to me on the phone, before Social Security, there was nothing. Before Medicare, there was nothing. Before Medicaid, that's not true. There was flawed as it was, the Ford Hospital. There were local innovations by employers or by the, um, I don't know, the Jewish American Burial Society, the Italian American Burial Society, the Armenian American Burial Society. That is the community stuff that Tocqueville traced. So those, is that public or private? It's somewhere in between. And I, in my work, um, think it, it, that that's been very much neglected, that it's a false contrast. There was plenty before Social Security. It was just different. And maybe insufficient, but maybe we weren't rich enough to provide all the private charity we need to provide. Or maybe we should teach our children to be committed to charity and to tie to charity as we tithe, uh, might tie that at church. So, so I, I'm interested in that, and that's kind of separate from the public. The public argument usually is about uh, all governments, right? Um, what's a what's a public good? It's interesting. Um, I I didn't talk about it because it was another professor, but I'm a big follower of James Buchanan, who, who um, wrote about public choice theory. It's a terrible name, but it basically says government competes with the private sector, um, and neither one of them is better. And his work was based on that of Italian Marxists like Amilcare Puviani. Um, the right, the right, and the left come together when it comes to big government power. And that work is very interesting. And if I knew Italian, I would translate Puviani because he did some fantastic work on tax that Buchanan translated for me. So anyway, I, all I'm saying is it's more subtle. Yeah. So there's this polarity between the rights of the individual to be left alone and to lead our life the way we want to without interference. And um, then the other polarity, as I see it, is the right, or not the right, but the needs of the common good. Not just me and mine, but all of us. And I wonder where you stand on that. What is the common good, and, and um, you know, what common good do you think is important? Well, if you, interview, if you interview Americans, they'll generally say they feel a tax, because a tax is how you support the common good. Do you agree with that, right? A tax that is fair is about what? What rate? Usually, they land somewhere between 15 and 30%. That is, of your dollars, you give one third. Like a tithe, huh? Maybe more, right? Yeah, but like it's, right, 10 or 20? What, you know, tithe is 10, right? I mean, way back, yeah. So, like, that's what, for professionals, currently, taxes can even average above that. Does any socialist understand what professionals pay in taxes? I'm talking about two dentists, right? 
So I am about where Americans are. I don't think, oh, it's not up to me, but I, I'm about for what the cliche is, which is somewhere between 15 and 30 of what you earn, you might give to some project of the government and hope that it's a good project. And I, I kind of think it should be less, but I know that that's what most people think. That's not what we're doing when you add in Social Security and the fact that seniors aren't likely in future to get their Social Security money because the rich don't need it, right? So think of all the taxes they pay in on Social Security that, that they'll probably never see. Um, think of that especially when the cap on Social Security is lifted and every dollar a rich person earns will, is subject to Social Security. Um, that's a lot of tax. So if you're saying rich should say more tax, pay more taxes, don't think about Warren. Well, I mean, one is saying, which is the logic. Um, it, 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 one should ask, how much is that? And that's why Warren Buffett paid. There are plenty of people who are rich who are professionals, like Warren Buffett's secretary. In terms of the common good, I really believe um, in individual communities. So one common good would be your church, one would be your college where you work here, one would be the state of Michigan, one would be Grand Rapids, one would be this county, one would be all your friends who read the same books as you and are in the same book club. And you have to help all those groups. I resist the idea that there's one common good because that suggests there's one set of rules for helping one another. Hello, um, my name is Jonathan Seymour and I am a student here at Grand Valley State. Uh, I'm very proud of this local community. I um, took a gap year from uh, high school after graduation and I went to work for Steelcase, uh, a great local company who has invested in my education. I would not be here if it was not for them. But I also comprehend that there are tons and tons of students that I go to school with who are thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. And there's no answer to that. Not every company is as is, is generous as Steelcase is. This company, this land was built, um, or this university right here, the Pew campus, was built by Robert Pew, the, the greatest steel um, um, uh, chairman we've ever had. Um, he's built this region, and I just think it's a little you have to have compassion and empathy. And I think all of you, um, when you talk about the individual, you're not considering that as a whole, society is, is better when we invest in each other. And I think the answer to that is through universal education. I think that's the only way forward. If we're going to compete with Scandinavia, uh, Sweden, the people who are innovative, more innovative than we are, that that's the way that we need to go. Um, also, 15 million senior citizens, I believe, are dependent on Social Security, and without Social Security, I believe that they'd be below the poverty line. So um, I'm not for taking that away. I'm I saying understand that. I understand that. And left-wing work will take it away because they will need the money, often to fund other. Uh, you know, they will break the Social Security contract. Okay. Um, often. Right. But can I answer the college question? Um, yes. I'm very concerned about college too. Why is college cost so much? One reason is we've subsidized it okay. a lot. And there's yeah. an iron law that you subsidize something, it, it, the price yeah. bounces up to compensate for the okay. subsidy. It's called, uh, I think it's after William Bennett, it's called Bennett's Law, and it, it kind of really works when you draw the charts. I think we should think of ways to make college cheaper. The I, You know, four-year college in a nice dormitory um, it's not necessarily what we all need anyhow. I agree. Um, and we waste a lot of time on the social stuff. There, it's not always productive or happy for us. There are other ways to make friends. Um, I always wanted to work for Steelcase. I really did. I'm from Chicago. So I, I kind of envy you. Um, but if, you, if college were less expensive, there could be more Steelcases. They could support double you. And okay. I'm, I'm for that. So how do, I think you should make a college less expensive. Universal would be so bad. Um, I, I attended university in Germany where college was basically free and the teacher never came to the class. They have a thing called the academic quarter hour in Germany. If the teacher's not there in 15 minutes, the students can leave and they don't get in trouble. That quarter hour happened a lot. Um, and that was because, that is, kids didn't have the class. And that's because 
um, the university couldn't really afford to deliver, so it cut supply. And there wasn't real incentive for the teachers to perform. They had tenure, but not necessary. you know, they didn't have anyone uh, holding them to account. Students are, in a way, clients, right? But if, stu if students aren't clients because they're not paying, who cares about the students? And there was a mutual contempt that was a function of the school being free. I think Grand Rapids could be like Scandinavia because it's a small place where everyone knows each other. Scandinavia is a place, at least historically, of one background where everyone goes to more or less the same church, right? So you have a set of, but for a, as diverse and beautiful a country, beautiful in its diversity as the United States, it's hard to socialize because everyone, no matter what, is different assumptions of what's expected, the level of the tithe, the duration of the tithe, what we do to each other, you know, um, do we put our coat on the seat to save for our husband, is that rude? Do we put our coat on all the seats to save for our friends, is that rude or is that kind? Depends how clannish you are, doesn't it? So, uh, so every, you know, we all have our mores and rules, so, so I think that difference um, is what America is and it's hard to have a, grand plan including free education. Um, I agree with you that the price has to come down. I agree. Very much. So, okay. Hi. Um, I want to just first say thank you for coming and talking with us today. I, I really appreciated your point um, regarding wanting to hold both parties accountable because um, as an independent, I tend to see both parties as just um, pretty much incapable right now of looking critical at their own positions and getting down to the root cause of some of the issues we have, um, like the high cost of public edu or uh, college education and like some of the health care issues that we face. Um, personally, I see that as more of a, uh, an issue of just the rising health issues we have in the United States. Um, we have just a huge number of people in this country that have a lot of health issues and and I think that um, bringing down or um, excuse me ensuring everyone is not going to bring down those costs I think it just will further incentivize industries to make us more dependent on other healthcare industries so I, I, I don't agree with that solution and I also want to um, respond to what the gentleman in the back was saying just a moment ago about making um, college education free um, I think that's a gross misrepresentation of what would happen. Um, if you look at Denmark, um, who's a more capitalized society, in my opinion, than the United States, they have a very robust social safety net and they pay about 45% taxes. Um, I personally would not want to be forced to pay for my education for the rest, rest of my life in the form of a tax, so I think that is a misrepresentation of free education. But I wanted to to kind of get down to um, my, my main question is, um, what do you think it would take us to get back to the table and discussing some of the first principles um, that both sides seem to fear, which is this idea of collective power? So on the right, you have them criticizing the left because um, there's, the, there's a fear of collective government and um, that sort of authoritative control. And on the left, you have them um, criticizing the right because they see that control falling more within um, major industries. So what, what do you think it would take to get us back to that principle? Uh, of uh, that, that, these are several questions, but the, I understand the main question. Um, I think uh, more serious public discussion. I count on teachers to, pre to present history fairly. You can't really teach anyone anything in a political campaign. Now let me tell you there was a thing called the Great Depression. They don't, that does not uh, work as campaign advertising, right? Um, so you have to expose people to history well before that, and once they know both sides, they, they, people can discuss reasonably. That's why all of us think history is so important. Um, and I honestly think if, if Americans compared historic events and discussed what happened, they would find compromises that were acceptable to most of us. But that doesn't happen. It's just two sides throwing mud at, at each other, um, both on the, from the right and from the left. You can't believe, um, speaking of the right, how hard it has been to sell Calvin Coolidge, the right-wing free market small government president, to the Republican Party 
why do you, oh no, Amity, well, we prefer McKinley to Coolidge. We prefer um, Grover Cleveland, and he was a Democrat, to Coolidge. And I say, why is that? Well, Coolidge was for austerity, and austerity never gets votes, so he's not a real Republican. Actually, Coolidge is the best example for the Republican Party. He's a wonderful example, and just because he isn't good on TV and isn't a sort of a soundbite um, of the right sort, he's completely, he's been more or less ignored by the party. So I, I agree with you. I, I wish people knew about Coolidge. I wish they knew about La Follette. And, and honestly, it's a softball answer, but I do think um, better information and freer discussion would be worth a lot. I, I, I wish public radio ha had um, different voices on it. It tends to have one line, more or less. It's a great resource. I wish Fox had more progressives on and didn't just fight with them, so across the board, you know. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. You anticipated my question in your last answer. It seems as if you have single-handedly reintroduced America to Silent Cal. What was the, the basis for that? What prompted you to explore a biography of Calvin Coolidge? Um, thank you for the question. So for those who don't know, I wrote a history of the 30s, which was all about what they broke, essentially. We broke the economy in the 1930s. So what was it that we broke? I didn't know that. I mean, I was a economic editorial writer. I didn't know much about the, tw the 20s, but so we broke something that was thriving in the 20s. So I got curious about the 20s, and there are two ways to write a book about the 20s. One is to write a book about the 20s called, I don't know what, The Roar, The Roaring 20s, right? Um, and the other is to write a book about the most important figure in the period. And if Calvin, you know, presidents are like stocks, you have to compare what they're really worth to their price in the marketplace, the intellectual marketplace. And Coolidge is, uh, and, and good investors um, like a big difference between price and value, because they can arbitrage that. Well, Coolidge is the most mispriced president for his value. He's priced real low, and his value is real high. So I, I found that uh, as, an, as an investment of several years, a worthwhile investment. You could really say something completely different from what, from what um, other people were saying, which was dramatic, and maybe actually get a better price, get him the price he deserves in intellectual currency and influence currency. I will add a final reason, because we're all human, as I said. I had an editor um, at the Wall Street Journal named Bob Bartley, and Bob never talked. He was from Iowa, but he was actually probably from someplace like Vermont. He had that farmer's way of not talking. So you would write years and years of editorials, and you'd never get a word of praise. My husband wrote one editorial about the lira, the old Italian currency, and he got back a note that said, good. And that was the only praise he got in 18 months. Imagine how he felt. And I kind of came to admire Bob Bartley because uh, so much. And Calvin, the way that he raised his employees uh, through restraint, but he, when, when they were in trouble, the same restrained men would always be at their side. He only came to your side when you were in trouble. What a great boss is that. So um, Coolidge is the pre-incarnation of Bob Bartley of the Wall Street Journal. I, I saw someone I knew in Coolidge because I'd met Bartley, and um, frankly, also in the Midwest. The Midwest is uh, Vermont displaced, right? The, the Coolidge's went, where did the Coolidge's go when they couldn't farm the rocks of Vermont? They went to Wisconsin. That is where they went, right? So, so there are a lot of them around here and in the Dakotas and Minnesota. So uh, I uh, think they're very familiar to Midwestern people and New Englanders, the Coolidge's. Pretty silent, pretty big hearted, pretty likable. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. I go to uh, Grand Valley. I am a junior and I'm a microbiology major. Um, so I know you talk a lot about um, these socialist programs being more experimental. 
Um, I'm a scientist, so I like recognize an experiment when I see one. And one of the big, big, biggest experiments in America has been capitalism. And the data that's been produced from capitalism is not necessarily something I would accept as a scientist. Um, uh, you would not accept the data about capitalism? Yes, I would not. Um, in America today, I think it's easy for, especially people in this room, to um, not really understand the damage that capitalism has done because most people in this room are um, like adults, white, probably better off if you're here. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's very easy to see how these capitalistic policies aren't affecting you because they roughly do not. Um, people are dying under capitalism, whether it be from not being able to afford insulin or being damaged by uh, the climate crisis. And, uh, what? Okay. Um, and I just think we need to um, step out of our personal bubbles to really understand how damaging the system we have now is to us and not just a potential system that could cost us a few extra dollars. We're, we're, well, we're sorry, uh, very sorry to hear of the trouble. We're well aware capitalism, I'm well aware, and I'm not a pure capitalism, we're well aware capitalism is, is not perfect. Um, the question is what could make it better? Um, and uh, if U.S. capitalism doesn't deserve to continue its experiment, what other model would you ever follow? What other model would you ever, ever follow for a big country such as ours? And where is the evidence that that model has done well beyond some places in Scandinavia that have become distinctly more capitalist lately because of the disaster impending due to their social democracy? What my, I mean, so you're comparing America to an imaginary counterfactual. That's the problem that we see. There is no place that it's the worst system except for any other. <laughs> I don't think we necessarily have to model our system after something else. I think uh, we as Americans have always been able to create new things. And I think that um, across this country, people are demanding change and we want things for the working middle class and not just the few billionaires at the top that capitalism serves to. And I think these things are um, healthcare that doesn't make us go bankrupt, um, a livable future on a planet that isn't covered in pollution, um, ha being able to go to college without being in debt for the rest of your life. And I think that these are socialist programs, yes, but it doesn't mean that we have to completely overhaul what we have to achieve these things. Well, thank you for that statement. Okay. Let's give Amity a hand. Thank you.